My next guest was Venezuela's former ambassador to the UN, before Chavez, and uh, a former UN Security Council president, Diego Arria. And back with us, former Trump Deputy National Security Advisor, Katie McFarland. Good to have you both here. Diego, welcome. Thank you. So you are now living in exile in the United States. You said four years ago they put a warrant out for your arrest. That's right. Why? They said that uh, Maria Corina Machado, Pedro Burelli, Gustavo Tarre, and myself were conspiring to kill the president, nothing less than that. Were you? There was no proof, no. I was in the big <laughs> Napoleon. I was playing tennis, as a matter of fact. Yeah, he thinks John Bolton wants to kill him, too. Yeah. I'm sorry. In I some ways, John honest. Bolton might want him, but uh, you, know, you, know, you don't list. do that. A long list. <laughs> look, I, you look at the tragedy of that country, and you, know, you remember Venezuela back in a time when it actually was quite po prosperous um, and had a much brighter, better future. Uh, what happens now? Because it's really been, um, it's at rock bottom, I would say, really rock bottom. And I don't think Maduro has much other uh, opportunity other than perhaps at this point to get out. Uh, Russia's apparently backing off. Uh, the Chinese, I don't know, I guess the Chinese are trying to help a little bit. Maybe the Iranians are trying to help a little bit. But, you know, we were the number one customer for their oil. 80% of their oil was all refined by us. We're out of the game, so where are they getting any money? We used to produce 14% of the United States oil consumption was here. Mm -hmm. But you know, and because I follow your show, mm -hmm. that uh, you are dealing with a group of narco criminals, so you're not dealing with the government. So it, it is very difficult for people who are not criminals and do not know the language to anticipate the behavior of these people. I just said that to the Norwegians last week in Oslo. I said, uh, you believe that you are dealing with the government. No, you are dealing with a mafia state uh, that has morphed into a narco state. That makes it uh, very, very difficult to deal with them. Uh, and the other thing is that people ask, what are the armed forces going to do? And I said, uh, the armed forces are not peripheral to the regime. They are the regime. So for them to fracture, what has to fracture is the regime. And now you see all these players that are now involved in Venezuela, the Chinese, the Russian, the Turkish. Those are, let's say, more modest ones. But we have the Hezbollah, we have the, the Colombian guerrillas, we have the cartels. It's Milan. like one bad place, right? <clears throat> KT McFarland, um, Venezuela seems to be courting all of uh, our enemies. Right here in our own hemisphere, right? I, I, I do believe that's a violation of the Monroe Doctrine. Yes. <laughs> well, the odd thing is that Secretary of State John Kerry in the Obama administration said the, that the Monroe Doctrine didn't matter anymore. The Monroe Doctrine says great powers are not going to be in our hemisphere. Um, Trish, I do want to point out, though, um, what the ambassador mentioned. At the beginning of the Trump administration, we looked at Venezuela and, and we recognized all the things he said, that it's a corrupt, it's a narco state, but that the way to solve it is to, behind the scenes, have American influence, American money, but con um, continue to encourage an internal um, revolutionary movement, um, a reform movement, but also to get Venezuela's wealthy neighbors to, as well, try to take the lead in what happens in that hemisphere. And that would be Colombia, that would be Brazil. Uh, yeah, Brazil Ambassador, Colombia. do you see that happening? I mean, you know, they, they really haven't been as forceful, perhaps, as Venezuela and Juan Guaido and folks like yourself would like, but are they inching in that direction? You know, when one speaks about the international community in our continent, the international community is the United States because they are the only ones who will do something about it. Uh, and in this uh, scenario, the only American president, and I, I, I dealt with President Bush, President Clinton, or even Obama, no one has been so committed and forceful and actually energizing the Venezuelans, not only the Venezuelans, generating a, a trust in the international in the international community to support Venezuela Very uh, because it's power dissuasion I believe yeah. that they have I think have to increase it a bit more uh, has raised a hope so we ne people didn't have before KT uh, just quickly back over to you because you were there in the early days of the administration you were very instrumental in uh, crafting the the thought process that would go into this uh, Venezuela ordeal. Um, so I do believe that was a compliment to you as well, ma'am. But uh, the president and his team that recognized that this was an opportunity to do some good. 
And also, the president understands. You actually, um, Trish, a couple of weeks ago, you had an interview with President Trump, and you got him to talk about the economic prospects of Venezuela. And I thought that was that was where his thinking is. This is a country that should be wealthy and powerful, and we're going to try to figure out how to do that with them. Hey. They've got oil. We've got technology to get the oil out of the ground. Uh, we can help their economy. They can help us. And uh, we can have peace in the Western Hemisphere. Get the Chinese, the Iranians, and the Russians out. Diego, Katie, good to see you guys. Thank, Thank you. you so much.